Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, before we start, let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to meet here on Zoom. I ask that we bless every individual that's here, um, different clubs and churches that they represent. Uh, we ask, uh, thank you uh, for allowing us the opportunity to rise another day on this Sabbath morning. And I ask that we start this devotional, that it would be something beneficial, something impactful, that we'll be able to learn something and be able to apply it to our personal lives and within our local churches. Lord, I ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Um, when Stephen asked me uh, to have today's devotional earlier in the week, um, I had just read a, co a column piece in the newspaper for that day, um, and it was titled Working and Dying Alone at Home. Um, I was going to summarize the article, uh, but I think it would minimize its impact on you. Um, I won't read it all, but I will read a portions large enough to hopefully give you a sense of who this individual was, what the story is about. Um, I may go a little longer than usual, uh, and I apologize for that. But hopefully, uh, it serves a positive purpose. Um, so in the article, uh, so I'm reading from the article. So Dominic Green signed out of work, as he always did, exactly at 4.30 p.m. Good afternoon, everyone. My shift has ended. The 28-year-old emailed from his desk in the living room of his Los Angeles apartment on a winter Wednesday afternoon. A remote contract worker, Dominic had never met any of his colleagues. A supervisor would later tell his father that she couldn't pick him out in a photo. We really don't know the people by anything except the work that they do, he remembered her saying. As the COVID-19 pandemic entered its third year, Dominic and his peers expected as much out of life. In 2020, Dominic's classes went remote. His June 2021 graduation ceremony was held as a drive through and all of his job interviews were conducted by video. Dominic, who was single and lived alone, had started his position as an epidemiologist in September, joining the 41% of white collar workers who were fully remote, spending their days at home in jobs that were more disconnected and isolating than ever. At the beginning and end of each shift, Dominic sent his bosses a mandatory email, clocking in and clocking out. By the next day, a Thursday, Dominic didn't send his 8 a.m. email. He missed the 4.30 p.m. sign out too. Friday also came and went with no signs of Dominic. Dominic's parents, Joseph and Jeannie Ann Green, who lived in Michigan, didn't hear from him over the weekend, but that was not unexpected. They were used to waiting for texts from their busy son. But by Monday, which was Martin Luther King Jr. Day, they grew worried. Joseph checked their family cellular plan and saw Dominic's phone had been dark for five days. Ginny Ann checked their joint bank account and saw it too showed no activity. By the time Dominic's body was discovered in his apartment Monday night, he was unrecognizable and had to be identified by the few fingerprints still visible on his hands. Late last summer, Dominic had packed up his things from his parents' house in Southern Michigan. He had been taking classes from inside his bedroom since his campus, Loma Linda University, near San Bernardino, shut down in 2020. Dominic worked as a contractor doing data entry at the Los Angeles Department of Public Health, tracking COVID-19 cases. It was his first job out of grad school where he received a master's degree in public health in June 2021. Although Dominic was a teleworker, the staffing agency wanted him to live in the LA area. The job paid well and Dominic was excited that he could afford an apartment of his own without needing roommates. When Dominic's parents came to town in October, they could tell he was proud in his own quiet way, smiling to himself as he showed them around. His signature white Converse shoes were lined up at the door, crisp new dish towels hung in the kitchen. Dominic had always been meticulous, even as a child, making his bed of his own accord since age four. Dominic had a plan for everything in life and much revolved around his career. He came from a family of professionals. His mother had been a registered nurse. His father had recently retired as a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force and everyone knew him as very type A. The contractor job was a stepping stone, Dominic told his family, one that would get him closer to the next milestone, a doctorate in epidemiology, when he planned to use to help underserved communities. Once he was financially secure, Dominic said he'd start a serious relationship and eventually get married and have five children. Over six feet tall with an athletic build and infectious smile, Dominic had full confidence in this part of the plan. Dominic's parents noticed how happy he seemed. He had a good job, a nice apartment, a car he loved. But at the same time, the pandemic had shrunk the Dominic's world. He was an introvert by nature and his main social contact had been through the classroom and daily workouts at the gym. In LA, he hardly left his apartment. To get out of the house at the end of the day, he'd hop in his Toyota Camry and take a long drive to pick up dinner. 
On nights and weekends, he boosted his resume with a part-time job doing academic research on sickle cell anemia. Um, Christmas time came, a big Marvel fan, Dominic was hoping, was looking forward to the new Spider-Man movie, and his older brother, Adriel, hoped to see it with him over the holiday. But Dominic told his family he couldn't join them back in Michigan. He needed to study for a professional exam. A few days after New Year's, Adriel, who works as a doctor in Fresno, texted Dominic to invite him to go camping with his wife. Dominic had always wanted to see Yosemite, but he said he had to finish a project for his part-time research job that weekend. It was the following week that his family noticed his unusual radio silence. On the Monday of on the night of Monday, January 17th, Joseph called an LA number that belonged to someone who had sent Dominic two text messages that afternoon. He reached Lisa, uh, an individual, a supervisor at the county uh, health department. That individual said he hadn't heard from Dominic since Wednesday and was concerned, but she added, technically, he doesn't work for us. The Greens, the parents, the Greens, asked a family friend who lived locally to head to Dominic's apartment to meet the police for a wellness check. As he waited, the friend went around, climbed back, and up into Dominic's first floor apartment. And there was Dominic on his bed, motionless, and he had probably been there for a few days, Joseph and Joseph Jeanne would learn. The Greens returned to LA to deal with Dominic's things. They waited outside the apartment while a hazmat team in full body suits and respirators cleaned his bedroom. The team left carrying red bags of medical waste. An industrial fan remained on blast. The Greens unzipped the plastic sheeting over the doorway and opened the door to Dominic's apartment. The stench of death hit them from the hallway. They wept as they packed his clothes and went through his possessions, sorting things to give away. His Yeti thermos, his free weights, his new back bike with only four miles on it. Um, other mysteries remained unsolved as to as they were cleaning out the, his apartment. They found boxes and boxes of clothes Dominic had recently ordered that still had all the tags. He had spent more than $2,000 assembling a new wardrobe that was far dressier than his usual uniform of track suits and beanies. But Dominic didn't see anyone and had nowhere to go. His family puzzled. Maybe they guessed Dominic thought his office would reopen soon and he wanted to have a nice set of work clothes. Maybe Dominic had put together a set of church clothes in anticipation of going to in-person services again. Back in Michigan, he had attended virtual church services with his family. Maybe Dominic had decided on a congregation to join in LA. They could only guess. The work done, the Greens gathered in a circle in the middle of the apartment, and even wearing masks, the smell was strong. Devoted Seventh-day Adventists, the family held hands, hands and sang a hymn. It was a song of hope, a central tenet of their faith. Back in Michigan, um, the Greens began to prepare for Dominic's funeral. Joseph and one of Dominic's supervisors at the county health department for some uh, asked the county health department for some nice words to read at the service. Their tradition was to hold funerals on Sundays. Um, close family and friends gathered around the coffin the night before uh, when the Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath ended to visit quietly with the body, tell stories, and draw strength privately before the whirlwind of a large funeral. The Saturday night gathering was a family tradition at Jeannie Ann's religious upbringing in Haiti. She belonged, she longed to hold Dominic's hand and touch his face to see him looking at peace in the casket like he was sleeping. She wanted to tell him that she loved him and missed him. I'm proud of you, Jeannie Ann would have said. Planning the gathering, she, Joseph, and Adriel discussed the possibility of opening this casket to get one last glimpse of them, even knowing what they saw would be imprinted on their minds. But the day before the vigil, the family received bad news from the funeral director. I'll be honest with you, she said, even with the embalming, he's in pretty bad shape. Taking Dominic out of refrigeration Saturday night, she said, it would be risky. After the Sabbath, the Greens and close friends gathered without the casket. Um, moving on a little bit further in terms of actual his, uh, the funeral. Um, it was later determined that Dominic, seemingly healthy, died of cardiomyopathy a heart condition that can cause sudden death. By all indications, Dominic got ready for bed that Wednesday night, laid down to sleep, and simply never woke up. How many people out there, maybe single, don't have somebody else at home to see when they're okay, to see that they're okay, his father asked. Today, nearly 60% of workers of, of whose jobs can be done remotely report that they've worked from home all or most of the time, almost triple the pre-pandemic numbers. Many have come to prefer the virtual workplace at the same time, a shift is underway and much of white collar work looks like this. Somebody working at home, sitting at a computer in their bedroom or living or living room 
all day alone. After the funeral, the Greens received an e-sympathy card from Dominic's colleagues at the county health department. His co-workers wrote messages that were as sweet as one can write under the circumstances. Dominic was known by his strong work ethic and character, wrote an individual, one of his supervisors. Character is what a person does when no one is looking. Dominic was a fabulous epidemiologist, a great person to work with, a valued member of the team, others said. Dominic and I were in the same cohort and we onboarded together, one woman wrote. Though we only shared a few emails here and there, he was very kind and will be sorely missed. With that, um, James 2, 14 and 26 speaks of faith without works as dead. Specifically, 14 verses 14 through 17 read as follows. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. While there are many unknowns regarding Dominic's social life and whether he attended a local church or not, there are numerous individuals that are turned our churches today whom we know very little about. They come week after week, but we may never get their name or contact information and just let them come and go week after week without interacting with them even once. Oftentimes we bring individuals in response to an evangelistic campaign or a week of prayer, and they are baptized shortly after. They come for a week or two, maybe a month, and then they're never seen again or heard from again. How can we contact them if we didn't know their name or able and are not able to get the contact information from the church clerk? There are others whom we know much about whom we have their contact information, and yet we don't reach out to them to see how they are doing or if everything is all right. What are we doing in our local churches to safeguard the overall well-being of our fellow brothers and sisters? I admit Dominic's case is an extreme example of what could go wrong when we live alone, um, but often do we check in on a brother or sister that didn't go to church this week or the week before? Yes, there are ministries and personnel whose duties are to do this work, but we can assist them and not let the burden fall entirely on them. Um, we could take this a step further and see the work we must do as Pathfinder leaders. Uh, we admit that Pathfinder clubs are not what they were pre-pandemic. There are many members and staff leaders who are not involved in the ministry that perhaps are just waiting to be contacted by you and me to be welcomed back into ministry. We'd only know if we reached out and found out. It is my prayer that Dominic's story had an impact on you today and prompts us to get into action and check in on our fellow brothers and sisters at our respective churches. Thank you.